fashion brands love tennis. They just do. Um, look at the, Gucci's got a tennis line out right now. You've got Lululemon that's come into the sport. Obviously Nike and Adidas, you've got Oncoming, they've got Ben Shelton, Iga Swiatek, the, the number one player in the world. And I've got Tony Godsick, tennis agent with Team 8 as we head into the Laver Cup right around the corner in Berlin. When you get rivals to become teammates for a short period of time, mm -hmm. it's, real, it's magical. Tony, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So let's just start this way. We're gonna talk about the Laver Cup, it's coming up, but let's kind of rewind. You have been Roger Federer's agent. Uh, you have had quite a ride with Federer. Obviously also there's Del Potro and other clients, but talk to me about how that relationship has evolved over the years. I mean. We'll talk about the Labor Cup, which you guys co-created, but managing the business of Roger Federer. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm a big fan, so this is, uh, this is fun for me to do. Um, I got very lucky. Actually, uh, next year it'll be 20 years uh, since I first met Roger. Uh, he had just um, won the US Open 2005 against Andre Agassi, and Ted Forsman and uh, one of my other clients, Monica Sellis at the time, uh, told me, hey, we've got a new client coming back to IMG and you're going to be the agent. So I actually really didn't do much to, to sign him. And so after he beat Andre, we started to work together and um, it seems like yesterday. I mean, it's been an incredible ride. I mean, he, you know, for the first, you know, four or five years, he was in the final of like every Grand Slam. So it was kind of, uh, you know, I had something really cool to sell, but he had like a white canvas at that time. So we were really able to sort of uh, create a brand strategy um, tennis provides you the opportunity to have, a, it's a global sport, so we said let's go find some, some global brands and uh, we were off to the races. And he's so wonderful and he participates so much in his business that it was really easy to partner with him and, and do really fun things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he over delivers all the time. So I never have to worry about the babysitting, you know, showing up on time, getting in trouble. You know, um, when he's in a room, you can tell he's actually happy to be there. You don't, on his face, some athletes you say, oh, well, you can tell yeah. when the clock, you know, hits midnight, they want out. Um, Roger really is, is an interesting person. He loves people. So, um, yeah, so we were just off to the races and um, it was fun. I mean, people say, oh, he's retired now. You, you must be retiring. I say, well, when he played, he had excuses, which is I'm practicing and I'm playing. Now he's not practicing and he's not playing. So we have a lot more time for, for business, um, you know, partnerships and different investments we've made. And the Labor Cup obviously was uh, something that we uh, created together back in 2015, 16. And to see it, you know, we're gonna be, it's our seventh year coming up here in Berlin in a few weeks, uh, it's amazing. But um, it's been a lot of fun. He is really one of a kind. So let's talk about the Labor Cup. First year without Federer playing. Uh, this or will second, be, uh, this will be, he retired in 22. So the third, uh, this will be the, Second edition. Second. Vancouver okay, okay. and now Berlin. Yeah. Got it. So, you know, how did that change things in terms of uh, which players you emphasize? You've still got uh, a number of the top 20 ranked in the world playing yep. this year, which is great. You know, I see Ben Shelton is, is going to be there and uh, you still have Rafa and a number of the biggest names. But obviously, I imagine Roger goes. Yep. And does he now kind of transition to becoming a, almost like an ambassador? Sure. So he's a, a co-founder and a creator of the event. Um, it's not the Federer Cup, it's the Labor Cup. Um, one of the really nice things when we got started with the Labor Cup, we needed sponsors and we obviously needed blue chip amazing sponsors and Roger had a portfolio of blue chip amazing sponsors and so um, Rolex is our founding sponsor and uh, we have UBS there as well and Mercedes and these are his brands. Um, On um, is, is a sponsor and Uniqlo. So he's there actually quite busy. You know, and I always tell uh, sponsors, he's actually probably more valuable now mm. that he's not playing because he actually has time to spend with their customers and uh, do interviews and, um, you know, welcome the players and things like that. So it's definitely changed. Um, we always called the Roger the ticket magnet. Literally, we would put tickets on sale. We wouldn't spend any money on advertising or marketing and the tickets would sell out within like an hour. Um, now it's, it's a bit different. Um, we're still been sold out and stuff, but we actually have to get creative and they're big stars now. I mean, as you mentioned, Rafa's playing, Carlos Alcaraz is playing yep. for the first time. Taylor Fritz. Uh, Taylor Fritz is playing. Um, ben Shelton, who's, you know, uh, is arguably going to be next, one of the next biggest stars here in the U.S. So, yeah. He's playing, Francis Tiafo is playing, he's still in the U.S. Open. So we have, a, you know, a plethora of, of big stars. So it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, but he, it's different now, but he comes for the whole week. 
He really enjoys it. I think he's, he's super proud of it. Um, he wanted to create, you know, he felt like, A, we've got to do something for Rod Labor. This guy, you know, basically took off a whole chunk of time to usher in the professional game. The guys are going to be out there and the women are going to be playing for three point something million dollars. Rod, you know, barely made that in his entire career. Right. Um, and he won two, you know, calendar year Grand Slams. And so Roger wanted to create a, pl there was no event where the past stars of tennis came back hmm. collectively and could interact with current stars and future stars. And that's sort of what the Laver Cup is all about. And so Roger also sort of geeks out at the fact that, you know, Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe are the captains. He loves spending time with those guys. Obviously, Rod Laver's there too, and he's such a legend. Um, and then you've got some of the biggest stars in the game with Nadal and others. So it's really, it's amazing. When you talk about, you know, captains and it rotates uh, city every year, this year it's in Berlin, uh, obvious parallels to the Ryder Cup in yep. golf. Uh, talk to me a little bit about trying to make it, if it's fair to say, the Ryder Cup of tennis and the thinking also with it being Team Europe versus Team Rest of World, which is kind of interesting there, yep. that it's not, it's, you know, golf is just U.S. and, and Europe or U.K. Yep. No, so, <clears throat> look, um, we would, you know, we love when we're compared to the Ryder Cup. I mean, they're, they've got a hundred year start on us. So we are a historical event with very little history. <laughs> so we're actually <laughs> trying to, to, to build the history. Um, you know, I think one of the, you saw it this summer, well, you see it every Olympics with basketball, but you saw it really with the Avengers this year with the big team. When you get rivals to become teammates for a short period of time, it's, it's magical. And that's, I think, what we've uh, created here. You know, it's not, uh, you know, these, some of the doubles combinations, a lot of people who play tennis really just play doubles. Right. But you never see the big stars playing together. And so this is an opportunity where we, we showcase the best of men's tennis in unique formats. Rivals become teammates. Um, and the te team competition matters. Hmm. You know, people, when we started, were like, well, you think the guys are going to try hard. I said, are you crazy? I mean, this was Roger's point, too. The peer pressure is amazing. You've got Macron and Borg sitting on the court coaching you. You've got the greats like Rod Labor watching. You've got your other sort of um, competitors watching, too. So... Um, these guys try really hard, and, and it's amazing. And I just think the unique, it's not all year long. This is just one weekend, and the players uh, seem to like it. And the fact that we rotate this around the world is really interesting. You know, it, we, we hit some of the cities that don't normally see a lot of tennis, or, you know, we've been to some cities that actually do see a lot of tennis and just love it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been great. But we love the comparison. I mean, you see the Ryder Cup's been so um, successful, and people sort of, um, they get so geared up to, to watch these combinations. And then the optics, the content that's mm -hmm. created, seeing these superstars on the same team, coaching one another, giving each other tips, um, I think is great. And there's, I mean, the uniforms matter too. You know, I think you, you see these guys all wearing different things. And the fact that these guys, I mean, the Labor Cup, we've got Team World is in red and Team Europe's in blue. And, you know, they're wearing their brands, which obviously was very important. We mm -hmm. wanted each player to be able to wear their brands. But the uniform look, I think, uh, every once in a while is, is wonderful. I wanted to ask you, uh, especially when we talk about managing Federer, about brands on the court and apparel. You know, for so many years, he had the Nike deal and the RF logo, then went to Uniqlo, which I remember covering at the time, and it was kind of amazing to sign a new apparel endorsement deal that late in his career. And now, of course, in the last few years, working with On, and you know, I know On as a running brand, but On getting into tennis shoes. Um, talk to me about kind of managing those deals and also uh, even now, now that he's retired, how that works with you know, using him as an ambassador and, as you said, in some ways maybe even more valuable now. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Roger spent, I think, over 24 years with Nike. It was amazing. They helped make him a huge star. Um, the contract was coming to an end. You know, what do you do with a 36-year-old, soon-to-be-retired athlete? I tried to convince them that you can do a lot. Um, they have so many different superstars. They do an amazing job. Um, and so, you know, we went out and looked for, for another deal. And because Roger actually has such a passion for fashion, um, it wasn't something that I fabricated. I mean, he'd always, you know, he's very close with Anna Wintour, him, mm. he and his wife, Mirka, and they've been to fashion shows, and he genuinely really likes fashion. So when we were able to, uh, when I was able to go to Japan and meet, meet Mr. Yanai and learn more about yeah. Uniqlo and fast retailing, it became very clear that uh, actually one of their top executives, John Jay, had a great quote. He said, look, Roger might retire from tennis, but he won't retire from life. Mm -hmm. And so it was interesting because they're all about lifewear. And yes, they are in tennis, but they're also about fashion and, 
And so it, it was a, a great fit. And, um, and so anyway, um, Nike decided, uh, you know, they didn't want to match, which was totally fine. And we were on our way and they, you know, fast retailing, Uniqlo, they don't make shoes and right. sneakers. So in the beginning, Roger wore um, the sneakers and I had gotten to know the on guys because I had invested with them a few years before. And so I just got to know the guys and they would always ask me, do you think it's ever possible we can do something with Roger? And I've said, no, he's with Nike. He'll be with Nike forever. Mm. And so sure enough, in 2018, when he uh, moved to Uniqlo, there became an opportunity. And at that point, I'd already gotten to know the founders and they were, you know, they started in 2011, I think, but they were, they were on their way. And um, every time I went to Zurich, I'd go speak to them. And um, I just, I, I saw they were building something unique. And then I started seeing all these shoes everywhere. Everywhere. And, um, and they believed, funny enough, um, they believed in tennis. They said, look, this is an interesting platform. We believe in it. Where, you know, some of the other brands, they don't focus as much on tennis. Some of the big brands out there have had some of the biggest superstars and maybe don't utilize them as much. Um, on really felt like, wow, there's something here with tennis. And so because a combination of Roger being injured, um, he had this uh, knee surgery plus COVID, he actually was home for a lot. And their headquarters are in Zurich. And so Roger could spend a lot of time with their uh, designers, their developers, with uh, Olivier Bernard, who's the original founder, coming up with a shoe. And I think they, I mean, they went through at least 10 different iterations of the shoe. And then when he was able to come back um, in Doha, he, mm -hmm. he wore the shoe. Awesome. And so, and it's been great, um, you know, and Uniqlo and, and On work really closely together. And, um, but they're two completely different brands. Um, they're both super global. And it's been fun. And, you know, when you're at one of the bigger brands, you're one of many. And especially with some of the, the real big brands like Nike, they've got so many superstars. Whereas Roger went to Uniqlo and he was a superstar there and they really focused on growing his brand. And then on was just starting and starting in tennis. And until they signed Zendaya. Now. Until they signed yeah. Zendaya, which was great because yeah. that was a part of the market they wanted to, to go after. And I would argue there's no bigger superstar in Hollywood at the moment, um, then Zendaya, and then she was in this the Challengers movie, mm -hmm. which was great for tennis. She Perfect was showing fit. up at tennis, yeah. so it really was great. And this was all their idea. I mean, these guys really have an incredible vision at on, and you know. But ultimately, where they're doing so well is they understand that their core business is the runner, and the athlete. You know, and so people are like, oh, what's the next superstar movie star they're going to sign? And I'm like, I think they're also going to focus on yeah. making sure you know uh, people win marathons, and they've got this new light spray technology that they just came up with. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun and it's been like a breath of fresh air. It's like a, a new career for Roger. Yeah, um, that's really so. cool. Good, obvious fit. Uh, it's funny, you know, mentioning Zendaya and the movie Challengers, uh, it's kind of a, a natural segue. It, it feels to me like there's more momentum in the last couple of years with tennis in America because now we once again have some big American stars. We've had more Americans, you know, hang around in this U.S. Open than in past years. Uh, on the women's side, there, there's Pagula. On the men's side, there's, you know, Big Foe and, and Ben Shelton. They had that incredible uh, really close battle, Tiafo and Shelton did, mm -hmm. and you've got these guys at the Labor Cup. Yep. Um, so let's kind of zoom out and talk about just state of the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what excites you when you look at the, the young stars today, having been, you know, 20 years in and around this business, and, um, you know, f feels like uh, things are in a really healthy place in, in the U.S. again for fandom. Yes. No, look, the U.S. Open has gone from strength to strength. I mean, it's, it's a massive operation and it's the, you know, it's obviously the best tennis in the world, but it's also sort of the must see, a, must attend event in the United States. So they've done a great job. I think also when I first started in the business in the early 90s, not to date myself when I was at IMG, in order to become super famous, you needed to make the middle weekend or the final weekend of a Grand Slam because then you were going to be on CBS or NBC or whatever it might be. Uh, now every athlete's got a channel of their own or multiple channels with TikTok and Instagram and Twitter or X um, and stuff. So they, they've got that going for them so they can sort of cultivate their brand throughout the entire year. Um, and then, you know, people uh, generally care about the content. You see there's content crews behind the scenes everywhere. It used to be taboo, the players would never allow um, cameras sort such, of behind such the access, scenes, yeah. such access, in the gym, leaving the locker room and all that stuff. And now the players are basically have accepted it and embrace it. And so, you know, you've got that. And then what's really nice, um, you, we were touching on it before with, with the fashion, is fashion brands 
love tennis. I mean, yep. they just do. Um, look at uh, Gucci's got a tennis line out right now. You've got Lululemon that's come into the sport. Obviously, Nike and Adidas. You've got Oncoming. They've got Ben Shelton, Iga Swiatek, the, the number one player in the world. When I go to the U.S. Open, I, I'm always struck by the polo stuff, too, the Ralph Lauren. I mean, they must make a killing. From, they they from do a great job. Weeks. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've spent some time talking to Patrice Levette, the, the CEO I've known when he was at Gillette. He was the president of Gillette when Roger was there. You know, they've got some great tennis stuff, and they've been uh, doing wonderful uh, things. I mean, they've been working with Ben Shelton with a fragrance, yeah. um, you know, launching it around the U.S. Open and, and stuff like that. So you've got, you see all these brands coming into them, and then they amplify tennis sort of outside of the grounds, which I think is really helpful. And then you've got people like Coco Golf. I mean, she's one of our clients, and I will tell you, she is she's amazing. Like, and she gets it. All her social stuff she does herself. It's all organic. She loves it. And um, you've got a bunch of stars that are, are doing that. I mean, look, Emma Navarro, great story. UVA, went to college for two years. College used to be, it wasn't the pathway for tennis, especially on the female side. If you went to college, it was kind of too late for you to make it um, as a pro. You know, Graf and Sellis and yeah. um, Sabatini and Hingis, they all 16, 17 years old were, you know, making deep runs and slams. Um, so if you went to college, it was over. Now, not only are they going to college, winning NCAAs, Emma did. Now NIL she, helps. You can NIL helps. I, you know, college. I'm not a big fan of this NIL stuff. Ah. I mean, I've seen some things in the in the last um, you know few weeks where I'm like, college sports, what's happening? It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I mean my son is a uh, he'll be a sophomore at Stanford, plays there. He's now in the ACC, you know, and uh, he's got aspirations to be a pro. I want him to have those aspirations, but he's also I've got aspirations as a father that he studies. How's that going to work? So he's done playing UNC or a lot more Virginia. Travel now too. That's a long flight into the wind back to Atlantic you know, Coast Conference. Yeah, uh, on the Pacific Coast. I don't know. So I think all that stuff will eventually get reset. May, certainly for the Olympic sports, um, maybe not sort of the big sports like like football. You know, the money mm -hmm. sports. Um, but college sports. You know, there's a pathway now from college to the pro game. You see tons of people. You know, John Isner started. Mm -hmm. it, he was at Georgia, and then you've got uh, Cam Nori um, did very well, and and so it's. I think that's very exciting, too. But there's, um, there's always going to be a new superstar. There always is. When Sampras and Agassi were leaving, everyone's like, oh, tennis is going to be dead on the men's side. And then Federer and came along. And people said about Federer and Nadal, Nadal Djokovic, when and, that era ends. And now Alcaraz is coming, and uh, Novak stayed around and is doing great still at 37 or whatever yep. it might be. Although and Alcaraz losing in the second round in, in straight sets was shocking. I think it was a shocking. It was a long summer for, for the players, you know, the Olympics and the emotion of the Olympics. The Olympics happened right after Wimbledon. I will say... <clears throat> the pressure on these athletes are bigger than ever um, because, you know, when, when a top superstar goes to a tournament, they're not just playing the tournament. So the first tournament they're playing when they go to the tournament is actually the tournament against their opponents, which is getting tougher and tougher. Then the big superstars have to deal with the media commitments, mm -hmm. the content we were talking about, and all that stuff. So that's a lot of pressure. And then the superstars, every champion puts pressure on themselves. So that's the third one. You're putting pressure on yourself. So you combine those three together, it's tough. And it happened. Tennis goes all year long. It never stops. And, uh, and that's what I love about the Labor Cup. I mean, going back to the Labor Cup, it's a three-day event. You know, it's not a week or two weeks. It's a three-day event. Um, and, I think, and I think that matters. You know, if you add more events to the calendar that a week, I mean, look, the slams are now, UST had a fan week. So they're sort of encroaching on a three-week event. The Masters 1000s are all 12 day events. That's sort of two days away from being a We're grand like slam. Becoming like the NFL, it's a year round news cycle. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But tennis really, especially you see it in, in the most famous female athletes in the world are always tennis players um, mm. because it's global. You think about it. Um, they're always the highest paid athletes on the, on the women's side. You know, Serena Williams, now Coco Golf. Um, back in the day, obviously, Monica Seles and um, Hingis and Kornikova and all these guys, they, tennis players. Um, but they have, they have a Super Bowl or Olympics four times a year with the slams yeah. and then other big events in major markets. So I think that's one of the beautiful things about tennis, being so global. It's a great place to end. We could talk about this all day, but, but we'll leave it there. Tony, thanks so much. Thanks for having me.